Okay, why I came to UCLA? Well, it was because Kelly James pushed me to come to UCLA and uh, I didn't have a scholarship offer or anything from USC. In fact, I didn't know anybody at USC at that time. So I came here and, uh, and was immediately just, I mean, I'd never met anybody like Dr. It wasn't Dr. Sawhill then. Clarence Sawhill was a warm, wonderful man uh, who knew how to organize a band and how to get a band to play and march and do it all at the same time. Amazing. Sound recording, Milo Jamison, his dad was a uh, minister right down on uh, Sunset at a great big church. We used to play there all the time. He played French horn. And uh, I think Dr. Sawhill was one of the one of the best people I ever met. There's the band marching out on the field. Uh, we did that, of course, uh, where I came from at uh, uh, San Bernardino Valley College. It was then. I'd already been in the Air Force for two and a half years and met John Williams. We were in the band together in Davis Monthan and Tucson, and uh, we were thrilled because. The band was good. There were good players in it. There were some vets from the uh, Second World War, and uh, they were pretty good players. And of course, there was all the guys that, like myself, so, so quite a few had come out of Army and Air Force bands and uh, wanted a career in music. And uh, it worked out for quite a few of us uh, that way. Uh, I don't know whether Dick DeFallo, uh, he played clarinet, and he also uh, was a, an associate conductor of the orchestra. And he eventually went on with uh, oh, the guy that went to Buffalo who just died a few weeks ago, a great composer, conductor. Anyway, uh, yeah, this, this was all very intricate. And we marched in groups of four, and the groups of four were so that one guy, in our case, our group of four knew exactly where to go and when to go and where to go. And that was, in our case, Ron Logan. Ron Logan knew where he was going at all times, and he, <laughs> he certainly did in the, in the business of music because he ended up uh, in charge of all the music at all the Disney parks around the world. We visit, the music we played, I was whether, whether it's true or not, somebody told me that George Gershwin said, wrote Strike Up the Band for the UCLA band. We took that as gospel. Um, and in, in Hills of Westwood, and whatever was uh, kind of current at the time. We never played, well, that was a little before rock and roll, I guess, but we played swing things and, I don't know, uh, it was always well arranged, it was fun to play, and it was challenging enough that so it was interesting. Um, we traveled, uh, going up north we always flew, and you want me to tell a, tell a story? Uh, I had was keeping alive, staying in UCLA, I had a CalVet uh, payment of God knows $112 a month. And I lived right ac almost across the street uh, in, a, in a private home and ate at uh, Ackerman or wherever and had dinner down at the VD, which we called the Village Delicatessen. And what all of us players would hang together. Um, this particular gig was, uh, well, I think we went to Cal. And I told Dr. Sahill that I had a job that I really needed to play on Saturday night because I needed the money. And he said, well, would you have time to play the game? And I said, yeah, but how am I going to get home? And he said, don't you worry, Bill, I'll take care of you. And uh, sure enough, I played halftime. And he said, now go over to that tunnel. I went over to the tunnel, and oh, now they're showing all these things that are no longer here, the cloister. <laughs> the Moulin Rouge I played there, Dino's Lodge, oh God. Anyway, uh, there was a, a station wagon waiting and I got in and the guy said, you're all set, you're all taken care of. He took me to the airport, 
Dr. Sawhill had paid, arranged, and I probably paid it out of his own pocket for me to get on the the uh, champagne flight that Western Airlines had, and have a glass of champagne and a fillet steak, and come back and make my job in time and make my whatever it paid. And uh, he always he understood about life, real life, and. Uh, I always remember that years later when I was uh, writing for a, a church, a Science of Mind church, I'd always hire his son, uh, Kenny, to play trombone because he was a good guy and, I, and he needed the gig and I'd pay him. And uh, I remember Dr. Sawhill came one Sunday and I'd written a whole slew of music for a brass group and with a couple of woodwinds. And my son, Eric, who at that time was probably 10, 8 years old, he sat with Dr. Sawhill, and Sawhill just charmed my son. I mean, not being corny or gushy, he just, all of a sudden I saw Eric was drawing on a program with Dr. Sawhill's good gold pen. And when he got through, he said, well, young man, that was really nice, that was beautiful. Good job, good job. Uh, Sawhill was the kind of guy that couldn't find, unless you were really screwing up, he always found a way to guide people and help them to get back on the right path. Uh, I never saw it to fail. And uh, he, was, he was just a great guy to be around. Um, now let's see. Let's see. We, yeah, we. I never went on a on a train. Well, we went on buses, of course, across town to go to the Rose Bowl or go to the uh, the Coliseum. And I always remember. I don't know why, but uh, Bing Crosby and his then girlfriend, an actress named Mona Freeman, came walking in the same tunnel as we did, and was like, "Oh man, you know, big star here." <laughs> um, Let's see, uh, some other people that were involved at that time, Don Sh uh, Shelton, who was a great, great saxophone player, still is, flute, clarinet, saxophone, alto, if it's got a reed on it, he can play it, and if it doesn't have a reed, like a flute, he's, he ended up, uh, while we were all going to school, he had a five day a week radio show at noon and he'd leave class to drive down in his old beat up Austin Healey 100 down to CBS and do his 15 minute Rusty Draper radio show. And uh, a great guy, still active, and he went into uh, singing uh, as well as playing. He was in the High Lows and in Singers Unlimited, uh, the Jays and Jamie in Chicago, and was extremely successful and still a wonderful, enthusiastic guy. That's what Dr. Sawhill said, that's, that's what stood out with, with Shelton was when he met him some place in, in uh, New Mexico. And he said, this young man, this blonde-headed young man just played great. And he said, and I told him, you have to come to UCLA. There's a lot of opportunity for you. And he did. Another one was Bernie Fleischer. He preceded me as the uh, president of Local 47. Uh, wonderful flutist, clarinet, alto. Uh, let's see, who else? Bill LeBlanc is in uh, this in the bands that I was in. Um, he unfortunately died too young, but uh, a, a talented man, a good ranger, and, and a decent trumpet player. We had, uh, in the group of four that's shown on the uh, cover of uh, Sports Illustrated, there's the shortest guy there is a guy, I can't remember his, his correct name, it was a Hispanic name, and he was a smart and funny and just great to get along with. And he got himself a little business. He would got all these kids from the barrio, buy wholesale flowers and put all these kids out on corners on Sunday and Saturday and holidays selling flowers, which he uh, made a good living at. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, 
Kelly James was a very talented guy who uh, was great with man music and with how to get a band. Oh, there's Capitol Records where I worked a thousand times. Um, he was just very skilled with, with bands and getting them to perform and march and so on. Uh, Dave Baskerville was a wonderful arranger. He specialized in writing things for bands. And they always sounded good. They always sounded like, not like uh, uh, some of the stuff we play. And a lot of arrangers here in town would bring, Dennis Farnan would bring arrangements out here, and we'd play them. As well as, uh, I told Dr. Seihild, you know, I said, you know, a lot of us are going to go into professional music, and uh, we, we need to be able to play the latest arrangements, jazz, if you will. And so he said, well, let me, arrange, let me see what I can do. And uh, he told me later that week that it was all right if we used the, uh, the band rehearsal room down, downstairs. And uh, Bob Florence used to come out here and bring his book of arrangements. And uh, we'd play, Don Shelton and all the rest of us. Don Nelligan, another guy who graduated from here and went directly into teaching. Good jazz trombone player and an excellent arranger and a good teacher of bands and music. There's so many others that uh, it's hard to remember. Oh, uh, Al Bialis. <laughs> he was a big, heavy set guy. He played good trumpet and he was very interested in writing and so on. And I Googled him the other day and I found his name. He's Dr. Bialis now. And uh, he's someplace in the Middle West to teaching and writing. And I always remember because I hired him to go to Lake Tahoe when I contracted the band for uh, Frank Sinatra's Cal Neva Lodge and he went up and, and played with me all summer. I always got a, a lar as many of the contingent of UCLA guys as I could because they were good players and good guys. Uh, some of the rehearsals um, were interesting in that uh, Sawhill always saw to it that he had picked out exactly where, where he knew there would, be work, there would have to be work done on an arrangement of composition. But he also could, with some unerring skill, get through to those of the students who were going to be music teachers what to look for, how to help players, what to do. It, it was kind of an amazing thing. Being older and having been in the Air Force already, and one of my best friends was John Williams, yes, John Williams of Star Wars, etc. I could see that uh, Dr. Sawhill was a, an, an unusual person and an unusual, that he was a bo born to be a teacher. Uh, the rehearsals were never brutal or, hard, you know. Uh, there was a wonderful trumpet player here uh, named Norton Brodsky. He's in the Union book, if you ever want to get a hold of him. And uh, I don't know what he's doing, or but he was a one heck of a trumpet player. And I always remember I'd play second to him in the symphony sometimes, and, and sometimes in the band. And then after a while, I, for some reason, saw Hill had me play first. Um, it was interesting, and this is nothing against, let's forget Norton for a minute, but there was another person who was playing first trumpet, and he was a very good player, and he got very nervous. And we were playing for the National Music Education, M-E-N-C, I think it's called, some convention here. And there was this big trumpet solo in this piece, I can't remember what it was. And this person started to play and got extremely nervous. And the more nervous he got, the shakier his vibrato got. And I saw it, he was, sweat was pouring off his face and Mr. Sawhill was looking very worried. So I just quietly came in and took it away. <laughs> and Sawhill looked up and smiled at me and the other guy just sort of patted my leg. Good, good. <laughs> um, yeah, we also had, uh, well, I don't know what we called it, the pep band or something, because 
I guess John Wooden was there, was here at that time. We played for basketball games, and that was one where Kelly used to kind of write as wild as he could and get other guys that wanted to write to write whatever they wanted. And so he, I remember, I looked at the part, and it went up to a couple of double A's above high C, and I said, geez, Kelly, it's, there's not too many guys in this town that are working that can play this. But I, I knew I could, so I did it. And he stopped the band afterwards. He says, you know, there's only a few guys in this town that can play it. And he, Bill Peterson just did it twice. You know, oh, God, come on. <laughs> anyway, it was fun. Uh, let's see. We... Uh, Band Bowl. I don't remember Band Bowl. Was that the where they had all the high school bands come in? Oh, that's the football game. Oh, okay. Oh, the Band Bowl. Oh, all right. Well, we that started with, uh, that was kind of an interesting story. Uh, Bill Ferguson, who was a good French horn player, uh, Don Nelligan, Tom Scott, a whole bunch of us used to get together just on Saturday just to run around and burn a few calories off and play, and we played touch football. And we're out there, and boy, we think we're getting pretty good. And there was a young guy came along, a very handsome young man, with some great big guys with him. And he said, you want to play a game? We said, sure, come on, let's play. So I remember, I have always been able to run fast. Uh, the last uh, ma uh, marathon I ran was in, I ran it in three three hours and eight set in eight minutes, which is pretty fast. Now that guy that was on the right, he's I remember him. Anyway, uh, <laughs> these guys started to play, and we thought, well, okay, I'll go straight down the field, and you throw me the ball, uh, blah blah blah. And I went streaking down the field. I thought I was streaking down the field. And I, saw, I looked back over my right shoulder, I saw the ball coming, and then I also saw a great big hand come right in front and catch the ball right on, in front of me. Well, after every time they had the ball, they scored a touchdown. Every time we had the ball, they scored a touchdown. So we played, there's Bill LeBlanc, the guy on the right, wonderful guy. So. Uh, we got through, and after when the score was like 72 to nothing, he just gave up and said, God, and finally one of the other guys said to this good-looking young man, I said, he said, who are you? He said, I'm Ricky Nelson. And uh, Ricky Nelson, the star, the, and he loved to play, to play football. And so he, uh, I said, who's that big guy? It was an All-American that uh, Paul Cameron that was on the UCLA football team. He was, one, he was Ricky's uh, bodyguard. There's a picture of uh, us getting on a plane to go someplace. Stanford, ah yes. Stanford, we played the game, and uh, Rafael Mendez, the great trumpet virtuoso, uh, his two sons went there, and they were both uh, studying to be doctors, and they vo both became uh, I can't remember what you call it, kidney specialists. Nice guys, and they played the trumpet trumpet very well. And I got to, I saw them at the halftime, and then we hung out later and just talked about his, their dad, who was just an, an amazing guy, and, and a wonderful man. Played first trumpet at MGM for quite a few years. I don't know. They're showing on this movie all about bail bonds. I I take the Fifth Amendment and uh, refused to incriminate myself, but I, I don't know anything about bail bonds. I never got arrested. Anyway, uh, there's the band f into the... Uh, yeah, some of these faces look really familiar and I c can't come up. Oh, one guy that played in the band and everything else was uh, Dave Duke, a French horn player. And uh, he can tell you lots of stories. Uh, he's a very talented French horn player. He has that perfect pitch, and he uh, he used to he learned uh, freedom j jazz dance, and he would play it on dates. And the big French horn player in this town was Vince De Rosa. He was number one. He always got at least double scale and maybe triple. 
and and uh, Dave Duke is going and and uh, you know he was a Vince De Rosa was afraid that somebody would write that for the French horns. He says, "Don't play that anymore." He didn't. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, game day. Well, game day we got here uh, way, be, you know, a lot of time before the game. We got a, a box lunch with an apple and a sandwich and a, some kind of cold drink. And before that, they had always had a pep rally, which we played for. And, of course, in my day, the football uh, coach was uh, Red Sanders, who was a real character. Uh, he could outthink and outcoach almost everybody. Usually, whoever was coaching at UCLA, Jess Hill, and they had a, a, a wrap-up show on Sunday with a guy in or sports columnist named Sam Balter, and there'd be Jess Hill looking really down in the mouth, and Red Sanders with this kind of southern, oh, good old boy smile on his face because he just would clean his clock. Uh, also, rehearsals for the band, I remember Dr. Sawhill said, Look, you're going to play the Star Spangled Banner. It's an anthem, it's not a dirge. We're not going to play it at the tempo that most people play it. And he took it much more briskly, and it had more uh, enthusiasm, more emotion to it, the way he did it. And then some of these bands had played, da, da, da. Then you think, oh, God, start looking at your watch to see how long this is going to take. Um, but anyway, he, Dr. Sawhill, he was really into rehearsing, and uh, he'd yell at us to lift those legs, lift those legs. And I guess we weren't doing it to his satisfaction. He was yelling through this, into this microphone or electric megaphone, whatever it was. Lift those legs, lift those legs. And he started to come down to correct something. He got about halfway down this kind of a pyramid that he stood on made out of wood and he fell. And he tumbled and hit the ground and we all just ran over because I was afraid he'd have a heart attack or he'd break it, broken something. And as we got close to him, he said, lift those legs. <laughs> it was a wonderful guy, a wonderful man. It was a great time. There was a great feeling, uh, both in the university as a whole here, and especially as a music department. I couldn't say that all these guys that were uh, teaching here were our faves, because a lot of them, there was one guy who was a, a kind of a, crummy flute, flute player, but he was the head of the music department for a while, and he hated jazz, and he saw us playing this Bob Florence arrangements, and he tried to stop it, but Mr. Saul wouldn't let him. And uh, and that, that always felt good, because Mr. Sawhill realized that we weren't all going to be trying to get kids to play the cornet and play concert band music. We were going to try and make it in Hollywood. And a lot of us uh, were lucky enough, successful enough to have a career. And uh, anyway, it was a good feeling. The kid, the other people here were just great. And uh, I remember it, there were such itch, interesting characters. There was a one professor here. I don't. I hope he's still alive. Dr. Robert Stevenson, an amazing man and a wonderful pianist. And I brought and he. <laughs> He'd come in and one day you could talk to Dr. Stevenson or Dr. Sawhill about your personal problems, your problems with some course or whatever. So I said, Dr. Stevenson, I'm trying to be able to do uh, two against three. And he said, well, that's just... <laughs> and then he showed me three against four and, you know, oh, okay. He gave less lectures one day. He said, we're going to talk about... Uh, uh, Giuseppe Verdi, whose sublime melodies were hampered by the by the pitiful uh, lyrics. I can't think of the right word. Uh, hammered out on the dull anvil of his librettist imagination. We all said, "What did he say? What did he say?" <laughs> he was marvelous, and he came. 
<coughs> years later, I brought my son out to see him. He gave a recital in Popper Hall and uh, played an all Chopin concert. And as he walked out, somebody that was with me said, your description of him was is perfect. Look at his shoes. Because he, he, he was dre well dressed, a nice suit and wingtip shoes, but the sole had come off the upper. And you could see, and it sort of wobbled like that. And you could see his socks through the, but it didn't matter to Doc, Dr. Stevenson. He, he sat down and played this fiendishly hard Chopin got through and you, everybody applauded and he stepped forward and he was very, he had thick, thick glasses and I was kind of waiting to try, I was right in the front row to catch him because he walked right to the apron of the stage and then he started talking and he said, of course you realize that at the time that Friedrich Chopin wrote this, his uh, affair with Georges Sand was at an end and in the meantime, so and so, there was a whole it was music, it was history, it was the world at that time. Wonderful man. And he also brought out, uh, oh, who's the little guy that was, he was a fr friend of uh, <coughs> Stravinsky and Schoenberg and, oh gosh, he, uh, the Thesaurus of Scale, Nicholas Lenimsky. He brought him out and he gave a lecture in, uh, in uh, Schoenberg and he was supposed to play, I know, because I talked to Dr. Stevenson, he was supposed to play, you know, uh, oh, there's the groups of four, the famous groups of four, I'll get to that in a minute. Anyway, he, uh, he said, oh, yes, yes, said Igor and I, oh, he loved, he loves good scotch, loved good scotch. And he, he, the more he talked, the more Dr. Stevenson wanted to get him back on music and things musical and so on, and he kept, and then he said, Look what I can do. And he turned around, put his back to the piano, and played some really hard thing backward with his back to the piano. <laughs> then he pulled an orange out of his pocket and ran it on the black keys and played a, 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 a polytonal piece. And Dr. Stevenson had had it. He says, Nicholas, stop that. <laughs> Great times. The groups of four were organized in the marching band so that everybody was in a group that stuck together as you changed from one f formation to another. And uh, as I think I said before, Ron Logan was the in charge of the our group of four because he knew where he was going at all times and in all parts of his life. And we'd follow him around like three puppies, Ed Warren, this other guy, and uh, Bill LeBlanc. And, uh, <laughs> we had a great time. Oh, let's see. Okay, there's there's the end. <laughs>